Welcome back to the episode of Serious Angler Podcast. Uh, tonight we have with us the Lake Erie Hammer, Andrew Full. How are we doing tonight, sir? Oh, not too bad. How about yourself? Uh, you know, could could be better, a little bit under the weather, but uh, we're doing good. Um, Want to send you a little shout out and say congratulations on being a uh, a new father. Oh, uh, thanks, congrats man. there. Yeah, uh, we're joking about that a little bit, but sounds like it's going well. Going great. Yeah, it's it's fun. I'm blessed. I have a very very forgiving wife to deal with my fishing <laughs> habits. <laughs> As I say, you you were mentioning you've been out in the lake all week. Sounds like uh, you've been pretty busy between that and the and the baby. So yeah, getting up at uh, four a.m. and then going to bed about midnight, and dealing with a crying baby. It's been pretty great. <laughs> it's the grind. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Today, I can feel it. I can hear it crying right now, and I feel bad for my wife. So <laughs> okay. she's a champ. She's a trooper. Trooper. Yeah. I just had to keep her for you. So oh, good. Just... Awesome. So um like every episode, what we start off with um is I'd like to hear your story on how you got into fishing, like who in- introduced you and how you got introduced to it. So I kinda wanna hear that story. All right. So we're gonna go way back elementary school days. There's this kid named Matt Elmer. I think it was like second grade, lived around the corner from me, and he was like <laughs> You want to hang out with me on my birthday we're gonna go fishing i was like well i've never gone fishing before so i was like sure let's go well he was a diehard perch fisherman him and his dad so we went up to all cop pier got a bucket of minnows and barbless hooks and tried to catch perch caught crap that day been hooked ever since <laughs> <laughs> just a fun awesome. thing i think we caught one fish and it was like a rock bass or a sunny and ever since i've been like pulling at the chain of my dad to take me fishing so it was, it was a cool experience for sure. So, so what got you into bass fishing then? All right. So another fun uh, instance, my best friend through high school, we weren't friends until about two weeks after high school ended. A kid named Sean Ferkins. Um, he walked into work. I was working at Wilson Farms at the time. And I, I knew he was a big fisherman and I knew of this little creek where we go catch smallmouth on like top waters and crankbaits and stuff. And I was like, Hey man, you want to go fishing? I want to show you something cool. And since that day, he got me into tournament bass fishing. I joined the local club and started really fishing hardcore after that. So yeah, he taught me how to bass fish. I taught him how to steelhead fish. So uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know you were into the, the whole steelhead game there. I've been trying to get it myself. A little undisclosed hobby I have of myself. Every Thanksgiving weekend, me and my buddy Justin go to the Salmon River for three days and grind it out and make drunken fools of ourselves, usually. So. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I was going to say, anybody who follows your Instagram all just sees giant smallmouth coming out of Lake Erie. Yeah, so <laughs> it's from like April till about November, and then from November till April, it'll go to the steelhead swing. Uh-huh. But I'm, I'm very post conscientious conscientious when it comes to steel. I don't like blowing up my spots. So oh, okay. yeah, I'll post them like three weeks after I fish there or just funny stuff like that. Yeah. Is, is it just me or is when you, it's like smallmouth, obviously, you know, for bass in general, relatively spots can be the same, but also year to year spots can change of what's, what's good, what the sweet spot is. But it seems like trout, the people are very more protective of their spots because they seem to stay the same. Is that is that correct? For the most part, like on your Lake Ontario trips, they're all hydroelectric creeks for the most part. All your big ones, Salmon River, Burt, Ionity Mile Creek, Oak Orchard. Besides the Lower River, they all stay the same. They're all power authority generated flow. So all the holes are the same every year. Where we start getting our hidden gems are like on Lake Erie trips where we hike three miles into the woods to fish a slate run that might be three foot deeper than the rest of it that has... 20 fish in it and nobody around so those are the ones we try to protect okay yeah that makes sense i feel like that's very distinct than uh you know lake erie where you have miles and upon miles of different area that you can cover and lake erie is funny because you could have community holes like myers reef and seneca and then you can have stuff that don't even have contour lines that are good so it's just one of those things I feel like the you know the best spots in Lake Erie are the the guys that are grinding out time on the graphs, 
Absolutely. Putting time on, yeah. Absolutely. Sure. You need transition areas, sand to rock or sand gravel or gravel to rock, boulders. There's, you can, you can do your own thing on here. You can fish 10 foot of water. You can fish 60 foot, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah. Depending, yeah. yeah. Depending on what you're comfortable with, there's big fish to be caught everywhere. Oh yeah, you know for sure. My my first ever experience on Lake Erie, I uh, went out with my buddy Alex Coral. We got on the water at five o'clock in the morning. Um, we didn't leave till nine p.m. Um, and that was the I didn't catch anything over four and a half, but that was the craziest day of fishing just because I learned so much from him. Because being a kayak angler, I don't have the most amazing electronics on obviously my boat like you would on a, on a bass boat but uh we probably spent 40 percent of that day graphing and That's it was true. crazy the amount of waypoints he had and he was showing me some of them he goes yeah this waypoint's from three years ago but there's no fish there now and he goes i'm just too lazy to get remove it right it's, <laughs> it's like it's just a crazy amount of time you put in reading your graph and how much electronics has become a factor but i i those uh, you know, the current breaks going into the Niagara, we were actually it was in like the first a half hour we were fishing just on the way out to go find fish offshore. Yeah, and we were we were just dragging swim baits and we were catching like three pounders and stuff and it was it was a blast because it was smallmouth there are completely different than like Canisius Lake smallmouth. Oh, and, for sure uh, they have two different structure. So, yeah, and they're they're two of their own. They're they're. they're I actually think uh, Canisius Lake Smalley's fight are a little harder, but I just, it's one of those things. When you catch them in 20 foot of water as opposed to 40, those 40 foot, six pound dogs tend to be dogs. They kind of fight like lake trout. They just pull. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I haven't experienced that yet. That is, that is one of my bucket list fishes over six for sure. We'll get um, it's just, it was crazy because Lake Erie, it's just like, I've never really fished a great lake before. Um, right. Being a kayak angler, I don't get out to there as much. Um, and I fish like you're in the kayak, but it's always been in the harbor. Mm -hmm. um, just because, you know, lining up days where I can take the kayak offshore, there's not very many of them. No. <laughs> um, especially with boat traffic, it's ridiculous. Um, but the, literally, it was just a huge, like a different beast. And because it really hit me when that first half an hour, he hooked into something he thought he was snagged. He was dragging a tube. And he thought he was like popping it and doing the line snap, and he's like uh, trying to get it unhooked, and he starts screaming off. He looks back at me, he's like, "That's not snag." And he goes, "I think I have a sturgeon." And he came up like ten minutes later, a huge sturgeon jumped right in front of the boat. It was the wildest thing. I was like, "Okay, I am not in familiar territory." <laughs> like, <laughs> some of them I think can get up to like seven or eight foot, so they're pretty. They're yeah. beasts, prehistoric beasts. That was, here as long as the dinosaurs were alive so yeah Crazy. It, was, it was nuts we had boats around us that were the guys were flipping out because they saw it jump right in front of us and i was so mad because i could have had the shot of my life like i am i am reviving a small mouth i had caught waiting for him to swim off and i'm facing this way towards the water and the front of the boat is towards you and he's the sturgeon jumps right in the trolling motor and i'm looking like this and I'm like, oh my god, like freaking out. And I'm like, I got it on GoPro. And then I realized, crap, the GoPro's on my chest, not my head. <laughs> I, was, I was so bummed because that would have been such a cool shot. Oh, but it, it was really nuts. I'd have it jumping. That would have been real sick. Oh, dude, I kid you not. I almost jumped in the boat. It was, it was, it was crazy. Oh. That was a wild day. Like, and it's, it's crazy too. With Lake Erie's. Like, Canisius, you can go out and target bass and pretty much stay on bass the entire time. You might run into some northerns. Or but like you're gonna stay on bass. Yeah. But here you'll run into walleye, you know, drum. Oh my god, there's so much drum in that lake. I haven't even like till I went there that time I'd realize, oh my gosh, they're everywhere. If you really want to have fun with drum, you have to come here about the third week of June and just go deep. Because there's only like three or four handful of spots that I know that the smallmouth will get on deep in June. And any other rock transition will be like 10 to 15 pound sheep had all that you can catch so <laughs> your fourth one your arm's tired enough i'm done i'm just going home <laughs> <laughs> and they'll, they, they'll hit pretty much anything is what i've what i've heard like, oh, experienced so. relatively and you always know when it's a sheep head too because your small mouth will kind of just load up on the rod tip and kind of get mushy right that sheep head will donk it you're just like crap <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> not the right kind. <laughs> so when did you when did you start getting into fishing like Erie? When did you kind of get out there and start figuring out the smallmouth? Um, I would say my first time ever fishing Lake Erie, it was I had my first boat. It was an old Ranger. I think it was a 375B with a 150 Yamaha Pro V, black and white, Lawrence X96 graphs. And I would just drive around looking for just little subtle rock transitions after reading everything, all the Bassmaster magazines. Like, this is what to look for. So I would drive out, me and my dad, and just idle around, not knowing what the heck we we're doing, throwing like six inch robo worms on rebar hooks. <laughs> giving it a shot and i mean that summer alone i think i caught three or four six pounders that was probably eight years ago now or nine years ago and from that point to now it's completely different so it's the fishing pressure is immensified if that makes any sense at all it, it's 10 times what it was nine years ago I mean, being ranked rn being ranked Top 10 or top 20 in Bassmaster, top 100 lakes just keeps bringing people here constantly. So the yeah. fish are uh, a lot harder to catch now than they were. So, I bet. yeah, I, bet. I mean, between social media, obviously the website, you know, I think every year they have a they make a top 100. Yep. Um, and and then obviously magazines growing up, but also just kind of fishing, I think in general is kind of in a sense blowing up. I've seen it, I don't know if it's just more focusing more on social media and social media is getting bigger these days where it, it seems like it's growing. Yeah. But I feel like, especially for Southern people too, is small, small, small mouths just seem to be more treasured than large mouth are, oh, at least sure. in my mind. And that's what like, especially in August when they had the tournaments up in St. Lawrence, it seemed like there was a swing where a lot of people decided to go up and fish once those tournaments were over because they saw what came out of it. Mm -hmm. So, it's the worst part they could have done too because now they're fishing retreads and beat up fish so they yep. didn't even really get the best experience they could yeah so, but yeah. i mean it's it's the one thing I, new york as expensive as it is to live here it is one of the most beautiful places outdoor wise and it has so much to offer uh because like you go to cayuga you'll catch seven eight pound largemouth in the pre-spawn yeah can, and you can catch five to six pound smallmouth pretty much from you know spring to you know from april well, you said april to november yeah you catch giant smallmouth all so, around the new, york, the new york city like it's it's nuts the latest i fished lake erie is a week before christmas and had like a 30 40 fish day and the water temp was 38 degrees freezing snowing raining blowing it was doing it all <laughs> miserable oh and we're cracking them on swim baits the craziest thing I've seen at Lake Erie is during college in the summer months, I worked at Field and Stream. Yeah. And, and I had a guy come in. Uh, he'd come in the day before, and he goes, um, you know, back in early February, I was catching smallmouth on a whopper plopper on Lake Erie. And I'm like, you know, I get people come in here saying they're the best bass master elite. You're throwing a Senko on Honey Oi. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, okay, okay, like, just go along with it. And he goes, no, I'm serious. And he could tell that I didn't buy it. And he goes, I'll bring in the video for you tomorrow. And I'm like, okay. This dude brings in his laptop, has the file with the date and everything. I kid you not, his GoPro, there's snow covered the entire bank. It is <laughs> snowing in the video. He is catching them on a 130. That's and I'm like, that is nuts. Like, that is unheard of. Like, why haven't you posted this? And he goes, I want to blow up my spot. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, you're missing out on a gold mine right now. I have some – I even have some large mouth stuff on Lake Erie that I – very solely protect like to my heart and soul because in the spring i can go oh this is one of my favorite memories i was fishing with my buddy sean and this is last may i had an entire week off of work and we fished in the morning for smallmouth for about three hours we got bored let, let me remind you we got bored catching four pounders <laughs> so we're like all right like we catch them like oh that's a four rat so that day we had um, four fish over five pounds, three over six, and he caught a seven, seven and a half. <laughs> on one stretch on the walls. And we're like, okay, smallies. Oh, small? Okay. So I turned to him and I go, all right, so now I think our best five went like 32, 33 pounds. Oh, my God. We're like, I go, let's go largemouth fishing. He goes, what? I go, I got some stuff I want to show you. So I take him to my area. 
we probably had 23 pounds of largemouth in two hours and caught 70. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so much fun. He goes, this is insane. It was like 75 degrees. The, the lake temp was 48 degrees. The largemouth were spawning where I was fishing because it was 70. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what? Yeah. So the water where the largemouth were was 70 degrees, what you're saying? Yeah. And the lake was 48. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. What the heck? <laughs> It that is was wild. This thing we're flipping bushes. So good luck trying to find some bushes on Lake Erie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no spot burner, but I might be browsing Google Maps tonight. <laughs> you probably won't have on that either. They're they're very they're very covered. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> and it, it, he was just blown away. He's like, I never knew there was this many largemouth. I go, one day the lake's gonna blow and I'm gonna win a tournament back here. I've tried it four times and like Club derbies, they don't bite in the summer. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> so I'm like, so I just have fun with them in May and I'm done with it. I, I went back there, I think, four times this year and whacked them every time. It was just a blast. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. That's so cool. I mean, you don't you don't hear or see about anybody catching largemouth. I've caught two, and that was there were dinks catching them on. A, I was just throwing a net rig. It's my first time fishing the harbor. Yeah. I was in the kayak, I, there's a video on it, and I'm just, um, it's literally, you know, we, we, you put your boat in at the harbor, it's on the back side of that, in that little cove. Oh, yeah. It's like 12 inch large. There there. And all those little coves and stuff, they're just so hard to catch. Yeah. And I've seen, I think my biggest largemouth I've caught outside the harbor was over six pounds on a crankbait. And I think it was like June. Back when I had no idea what I was doing. I was fishing with my neighbor, and we were walleye trolling all the time. And he's like, oh, well, we're going to come back in. And I think, actually, his motor died, so we had to hook up the trolling motor. And I just kind of cast up the crankbait and caught it on a fluke. When I had ugly stick rods and spinning reels, and I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, <laughs> That's you think awesome. I'll ever be able to catch that fish again? No. <laughs> <laughs> Luck. Yeah, I mean... I, that that day, I had, pl- I had intended on going out onto the lake because it was, granted, it's Lake Erie, so there's always going to see traffic. But it was a weekday. It wasn't. It was early. It wasn't going to see too much action. But my, I freaking forgot the, my battery for my my uh, graph. Yeah. So I was so bummed. So I just I'm like, screw it. I'm just staying in the harbor. I mean, if I'm going to fish blind on the lake, it's going to take me forever just to find something. So I, um, literally, it's. The guys say that the guys that I talked to, like Alex, that fish at uh, Erie a lot, um, they call it like the Seagull Island or something. Where it's you, get you, know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, that's where I was fishing. I got oh, it was close. <laughs> I, I was like hunkering down a bunch of times because it oh, it was scary. But I caught a, I caught a bunch of decent smallmouth, like over four over there. It wasn't like anything crazy, but I had a full day of just catching tons of spawning smallmouth over there, just dragging a a Ned rig. I'll never forget the first time I took my wife bass fishing on Lake Erie on um on my last boat. She got pooped on, I think, twice in the same day in that corner. I was like, you're good oh. luck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. So, like, it was just it was funny stuff. Like, oh, my gosh. But, uh, I have I was... another... Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. I was just going to say, like, in that corner, when I first went over there, I, I caught one. I caught a drum, and then I caught a smallmouth. It was like a 13-inch right off the bat. And I caught another one, like it was a 17 incher. I'm like, okay, there's fish here, but I'm looking around and I'm seeing all the seagulls. I'm like, I need to go very slowly so that I don't spook anything. First time I spook something, that's when I set the hook. Yeah. And I'm nuts. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, I'm wishing that's I had an umbrella. I think yeah. actually Dave Mercer did a, um, like a Harbor Smash Fest video and they filmed over there. And I think either him or Simon Frost got pooped on <laughs> in the video. So, like, his facts of fishing show i was dying i was like i know that spot <laughs> <laughs> That's all. i'm gonna have to pull that up after this i gotta i gotta see that i think it's actually called harbor harbor smash fest harbor smash fest okay i'm gonna have to look that up after this h-a-r-b-o-u-r because i spell everything funny over in canada sorry <laughs> canadian buddies but i always pick on them, so they call me damn yankee and i just pick on them so. yeah Canadians, they're they're great people. Love all. <laughs> they they are definitely uh, an interesting people. I I played hockey a bunch up in Canada, and 
have a bunch of guys still to this day that I'm friends with, and oh my gosh, they still give me so much crap. Is that was the nicest people in the world too, which is the funniest part. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yep. And uh, I remember my first practice playing for a Canadian hockey team. I walked in, and the first thing they told me was, "This was back when that trend of socks and sandals started." Oh so God! I walked in with that, and they're like socks and sandals, like in their accent, and I'm like, "Like, oh great, this is gonna be a long summer." <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Oh. So talking about Lake Erie a little bit more, if you could give like a pros and cons of fishing Lake Erie, um, I mean, yeah, I like best things about it, worst things about it. Best things about it, um, first of all, the fish are big. There's a lot of them. I think this is the best year I've had on three to five pound fish. That being said, last year I caught more six pounders than I ever have in my entire life. This year I've only caught three fish over five pounds. But oh, a ton of four pounders every tournament every time i've been out we're averaging 21 to 23 pounds each time for our best five um biggest con is the wind can call for southwest five to ten and it'll blow 25 to 30 and have four footers so you always have to be ready to get rocked (laughs) (laughs) yeah uh wow okay yeah when i i'm gonna go on out there it said it was said south Southeast winds at three, and it was west out of like 10, 15. Yeah, you have like two foot rollers, and you're like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> yes. Like Buffalo creates like this weird vortex of weather. It can, if you ever look at the radar in the summer, you'll see thunderstorms build in Canada, and they hit Lake Erie right at the convergence of Buffalo where it hits the Niagara River, and they'll disappear, break up, and go north and south, and then realign after they pass Buffalo. It's like, a Bermuda Triangle effect. It's the weirdest <laughs> thing. And then in the winter time, it dumps 130 inches of snow on us. So it's like, can't win. <laughs> Buffalo is the weirdest place on earth. <laughs> so we have great wings and big smallmouth and fantastic walleye fishing for whoever wants to go walleye fishing. So yeah, uh, my my buddy Alex actually caught. It was easily over. I want to say 30. Uh, he's dragging a tube and he caught it. He caught a walleye and he goes. It was like, we're eating good tonight, but then he's like, ah, <laughs> screw it, and he just tosses it. It was, it was perch fishing, but the walleye, yeah. Walleye. Every time I catch one, it goes home and goes in the freezer, because I love walleye tacos. So, oh, it's a free meal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who, who is, uh, how do you pronounce his name, Dennis? Is it Kreese? Yeah. 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 So he catches a lot of, he eats a lot of his fish he catches, at least. He's a good dude. I just saw him on Saturday and talked to him for a little bit, so he's actually... We're running a couple tournaments. The club I was president of, I stepped down due to the birth of my daughter. But we're running three fall series tournaments. He's going to come over and fish all of them. So talk to Dennis a lot. He's a good guy. It seems like uh, he's. I've got when I went out there fishing my kayak. He kind of gave me a few pointers on fishing the, the harbor and whatnot and what to look for. Absolutely. Uh, he seems like a really genuine guy. I haven't seen him post about Saturday. I don't know how he did. No, did he didn't. I believe he came in. I want to say it was either eighth or sixth. I don't remember. He did pretty well. Yeah, he was he top was ten. Ever. So he so, um, that enough. So yeah, he should know. He should know the ins and outs of that place. Oh, Seems like he's out there every day. Oh, I'm I'm envious of his lifestyle. I hope to be there soon. So nice. Yeah. yeah, he seems like a really down to earth guy. He uh, he's asked about uh like Oneida and stuff. He fished that I think with his dad. He said he was doing. Yeah. Um, I believe he fished the uh, Eastern Open, the Bassmaster Eastern <laughs> Open at Oneida. I don't think he did very well, but I, I yeah, he had like a disappointing Instagram post, but uh, yeah. seems genuine. So shout out to uh, Dennis if he's listening at all. He's a great guy. I was more worried about my buddy Dustin, who qualified for the Elite Series. So I was kind of following him like tooth and nail the whole week. I'm like, please let him catch him. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, I don't know. Yeah, no night. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, I think he weighed in four fish the second day, but it was enough for him to finish second in the Eastern Open standing. So qualified for the Elite Series. That's awesome. Yeah, can't wait for him to come up here this November and fish with him for a day. That was fun. <laughs> yeah. So uh, last year, go trying ahead. Trying to remember who won that. I want to say. I want to say Jamie Hartman, but I know he was in the top five. Oh, it's um Ray Buck, I believe. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yep. Ray Buck. He won the BFL there a couple weeks earlier too. So he's he's had, out, a summer, he? had a good summer <laughs> on Oneida. Sounds like. It. Oh, 
that is like my least favorite lake. I've never done good when I fished it. It's it's those fish move so much. They're like lone wolves, but they come in wolf packs, and you'll catch them one day here, and the next day they'll be three miles down the lake chasing bait. And you're just like, where'd my fish go? So <laughs> I, I can't stay away from bait chasing smallies. I prefer them to eat gobies and crawdads in forty foot of water. <laughs> They're a little more predictable. <laughs> you catch one, you'll catch 20, but if you don't catch the one, you won't catch any, is what I've heard. Or yeah. you'll catch 30 chain pickerel and just get all frustrated. <laughs> so Yeah, I, I've been there twice. Once when the ice was frozen, and then once when there was actually open water, and that was late August. Uh, I had coached a cross camp up in Massachusetts, and I had gone out there. I launched way north. All I could find was pickerel off the bat. Yeah, I was getting I was getting pissed. And I'm like, well, I'm all I'm gonna catch is pickerel today, and there's gonna be no bass. But then, uh, I kind of was just like, you know what, screw it. Like I went out and found uh, a, the grass line, and I just threw a spook, and it was cloudy the whole day. And I'm like, I'm just gonna fish fun. I'm not gonna try and like go after something specific and force feed him. Figures as soon as I start to relax, not paying attention, I start getting blown up by smallmouth and largemouth. It, it was a fun day. It was. I didn't catch any like you don't catch any giants on Oneida. But you'll you'll catch the numbers if you can find them. A four pounder is a unicorn there. It seems like on a smallmouth, but you're targeting largemouth. There's some giant largies in that. Way. Yeah, yeah. If you can find them, for sure, like, you got to hit them at the right time. Was what I heard. But that that north end I've heard is really good for frogging. If you can, you know, sure. if, if they're in there, they're in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big question mark. If. If yeah, it seems like they are very very finicky. But I mean, the guys who fish that every day. Well, they'll whack them. They know it inside out. Yeah, it's also a really dangerous lake. Is what I've heard with the the rocks and the shoals. A lot of shoals, pancake shoals in the north end. Uh, there's a couple. I think it's like Muskrat Bay. There's one that sticks out. Just looking at maps, I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna run down the middle of the lake if I ever go there. So I'm free and clear of everything. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that would. I like my kayak, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, right now I'm boatless, so I'm. Boat shopping, so I'm hoping that goes well for the first city here. So that's right. I remember you were you were selling the boat. When yeah. when did you end up selling that? I ended up selling it about two weeks after I posted it, and it was right after the birth of my daughter. I wasn't selling it to sell it; I was selling it to fund my next boat purchase after I got my captain's license. So nice. with nice. My, my first class is tomorrow night. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, hopefully. Uh, I'll be a certified captain by the end of November, and I can start guiding next year. That'll be a blast. Heck yeah. Sounds like I'll be in your boat next summer. <laughs> I'll be a day. Worse. We'll figure it out. So, That's awesome. Favorite times to fish in Erie is spring and fall. Like, late October after that weird summer-fall transition, late October into December is just incredible. Nobody's on the water, and you can really catch a fish of a lifetime. So sounds like I might need to make a trip home for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, they can they can handle a weekend here without me, right? Yeah, maybe. I don't <laughs> football will do without you, but <laughs> <laughs> they've been struggling with me. So I mean, who, maybe who it's a good omen to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Jeez. Yeah. So so talking about Erie, um, you know, because obviously it's like I mentioned earlier, it's a whole different beast than what I'm used to with like Canisius and. For those who don't know New York lakes, it's very small glacier lakes. Um, how do you, so your your approach going into fishing Erie versus, say, like a small glacier lake like Canisius, how, how do you change your approach or your mindset going into those? So it's funny. I prefer largemouth fishing. So Lake Erie is sissy sticks, Canisius, Finger Lakes are big seven, six heavies, flipping rods and going to town with heavy lines so lake erie all my rods are going to have like 10 pound braid so i use all p line stuff 10 pound braid and either on my drop shot rods i have six pound tactical um fluorocarbon usually a two uh, i'll make my leader maybe 10 foot so i can reel it into my reel as i'm fighting the fish so my knot doesn't slip um and then ned rig rods will be eight pound tests and if i am running anything on a bait caster the most i'll do is 10. okay so, and then with the finger lakes, like I said, it's it guns out time. Big rods, big line, and gonna flip grass and docks all day. 
<laughs> it's a big, it's like a black and white difference right there. But I mean, the colors tend to stay the same: green pumpkins, watermelons, and if you go to your Finger Lakes, they're alewife flakes, right? So Canisius, I'm thinking. If I'm throwing a chair bait, I'm going white or white and chartreuse to make the alewives. I'm going to pick up a green pumpkin jig and maybe a black and blue jig. And that's about all I have tied on when I go. Yeah. A drop and echo rig. But, I mean, the difference between a Finger Lake and Lake Erie is you want to mimic a goby in Lake Erie. So, you're looking for any goby type baits like Erie darters, uh, three-inch Sankos, Berkeley gulp fries, stuff like that. And then Finger Lakes are more finesse words like striking finesse um robo worms etc but on the drop shot side yeah i was gonna say i think the the six inch straight tail robo worm in morning dawn is like a cayuga staple for like throwing a power shot <laughs> <laughs> i mean cats out of the bag jordan lee kind of ruined that for all of us funny story about cayuga i, I went there this um was it i think the week or two after the spawn right i was talking to you about it cayuga and it was the first time I ever fished a lake, and the guy I fished with, Jeff Hippert, um, really good buffalo Lake Erie stick. It was his first time, I think, ever on the lake. So both of us, our first time ever there, and the first day of practice, I think we had like 23 pounds, 24 <laughs> pounds on largemouth. And we're like, all right, we can get down with this. And we ended up catching all of our fish on a six-inch robo worm. And in morning dawn, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah clumps like it was the dumbest thing ever so and i mean i think we had 18 pounds in our first 15 casts in the morning and then just kind of grinded it out and then the wind blew 40 miles out of the north and we're like well our spot screwed so what do we do now <laughs> yep that lake anything north or south it's going to be choppy anything east or west it's going to be flat calm yeah it's it's an it's an incredible fishery it it really is because the smallmouth spawns so late Mm -hmm. uh, because it's so deep down in the south end of the lake and the water stays so much colder. But yeah, I mean, I remember hearing a bunch of chatter of guys kind of getting pissed because Jordan Lee kind of let the, you know, during that uh, the Elite Series when they kept highlighting what he was using at Cayuga and guys were like, stop showing this. Like, everyone's going to start throwing it. It's like, uh, but it's, I'm like, my favorite finger leg bait is literally out of the bag now. And yeah. <laughs> I, I live an hour and 40 minutes from Canisius, which is the closest Finger Lake like, to my house. And on a Saturday morning, if there's a tournament on Canisius or I can fun fish Lake Erie, I'm probably going to go to Canisius just because they shot a giant large mouth. It's, so. It was rough this summer before, before I left. It was a lot of guys, the Tuesday nighters, um, they were, it was record lows. Like it, guys were barely winning with nine pounds. It was Whereas usually it's 12 to 13, like guys are crushing them. I mean, you'll still find that one kicker, but it's finding the multiples in the water clarity. One day you'll go there, it's crystal. And usually it stays crystal. Like once pre-spawn's over and you're getting to June, it's crystal clear for the entire summer. Mm -hmm. you'll, have a couple, you'll have a couple days where it's you know kind of iffy in the north end because so much boaters. Um, but it was it was brown. Like it was gross. Like you couldn't it, – it was, it was a weird summer. And, like spraying weeds yeah and there was no like it was a hard time finding grass there was li very little to any grass in the entire lake so guys literally were drop shotting the entire summer where it's usually known as a flipping lake yeah it's i got so frustrated with it i refused to go during the day i'd only go i would get there at 11 p.m and i would throw a walker plopper and uh that's the only way you could catch bigs on canisius at least in my experience like there's incredible it once this summer and i had a pretty good day throwing a chatterbait but the wind was blowing about 20 miles an hour and i found one section of milfoil that was actually kind of good and milked it for everything that it had and i'm yeah. catching like a 38 inch pike and destroyed my jackhammer it's absolutely destroyed and i haven't picked it up since i'm like oh still sick about it <laughs> Uh, the z-man customer service is so good about that though if, like, if you send them a picture over instagram they'll send you like three new ones that's sweet. I should do yeah. it. No, it, you should, because I've done that three different times where I just used a regular classic. Yeah. And I had the blade break off. And I sent them a simple picture. I'm like, is there an easy fix to it? And they're like, just send me your address. That's your fix. So then they just sent me, like, you know, stickers, plastics. They sent razor shads. Like, that's cool. And, yeah. No, they're really good about that. So you could easily get another jackhammer from it. But 
Yeah, the, the cool about that lake is the tigers. The tigers in there, and a, they get some big northerns. It's funny. I've I've probably fished Canisius thirty times. I've never caught a tiger there. Yeah, they're hard to find. They are hard to find. But uh, this summer, it seemed like more and more people were catching them because uh, I think they put weeds. They say they put in two. Th- my buddy, he's from ESF. He said they put around two thousand of them a year. Yeah. So they're stocked and they can't breed. Right. So it's. Uh, I think the, the biggest one I I've heard at least that being taken out of there was forty two this summer. It's a big tiger, and they're gorgeous too. Like I hate catching pike, but I have no problem catching a tiger. I, I love that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> your world when you when they hit right. Yeah, so, I've it's... broken a few off, but I've never landed one. So makes me sad. That being said, I've on the Niagara River, which is five minutes from my house, I've caught. 45 inch musky, like barred musky, spotted musky on six pound test and a drop shot and don't break them off. But I'll go to Canisius <laughs> and break off a tiger musky on a jig. So I'm just like, what? <laughs> this makes no sense. Yeah, figures. It's just like their teeth are sharper or something. Yeah, maybe. It's weird. Like, who knows? Yeah, going back to Dennis, so he catches musky on that river all the time. Yeah. He, I've been really tempted to shoot him a message and, you know, hey, put me on one. <laughs> Give, give <laughs> my goal is when I get my next boat, I'm going to get some musky gear and learn how to cast for them. So I just think it'd be a fun little side hobby since I have the foot of Sheridan ramp. I think it's nine minutes from my house so straight down the road. I make one right hand turn and I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> that must be nice. <laughs> so I, I have, I think Buffalo's 18 minutes from my house, foot of Sheridan's 10, and I have. Isle View, which is where most of the tournaments in the river are run out, which is about 15. So oh, it's pretty yeah, nice. Convenient. Yeah, it's very convenient. So, I, I used to, my house, uh, my family originally was in, was five minutes from Canisius. Mm-hmm. Like you said, I would take a, take a left, take a right, just go all the way down the road, and pretty much I can launch my kayak right at the north end. Awesome. Uh, but now my family has moved to Victor. So pretty much, I think most of my time is going to be spent at Sodus or Cayuga if I go back home this summer. Boy, Bay was good this summer. I heard. Yeah, yeah. The my buddy caught, uh, yeah, yeah, my buddy caught an eight pounder out of there, which was nuts. Um, the thing was I'm gigantic. Jumping. Yeah, <laughs> they're in there. They, you can. I mean, uh, one of the guys who's a stick out on Sodus, uh, Jeff Marionetti. I don't know yeah. if you ever. Yeah, he he whacks him. He he knows that place like the back of his hand. I think it's his home turf. So yeah, well, just, like, just, oh yeah, him and Kevin both live. I think yeah. like five minutes from there. So they yeah. whack wherever they go. Yeah, it's funny. I I think I showed up to a tournament at Cuca two falls ago, and they're like, "Oh great, you're at the wrong place. Why are the Buffalo Boys at Cuca? We ended up beating them on their home turf. Oh, that's just a sting. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, it, it's always fun when I can see Kevin and Jeff. They're good people. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, I've talked to them a few times. I haven't talked to Kevin much at all. Just kind of follow their social media. But they just they just won the the Cuca tournament out there. I saw that. I think they had what twenty six boats or something like that. It's a lot of boats for that little lake. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you talk about a lot of boats for a little lake. Can you just when you get like forty two boats for that lake? Oh my gosh. State anglers when they had like 65 on honey eye. Oh my god, how do you fish that? Like, that's just that's pure luck. Like, yeah. you hunker down in a little area and go. Yeah, uh, you just try to defend your turf at that point. Like, it's you can't really do much. There's so many fish in honey eye that doesn't matter. You'll catch yeah. five. If you go to honey eye and you don't catch five fish, you should quit bass fishing. <laughs> I've said that, I said that exact same line. <laughs> I've had people come in when I was working at Field and Stream asking me, like, where's a place where I can just go catch a bunch of fish? I'm like, honey, honey. And they're like, I'll catch them. I'm like, if you don't, stop fishing. <laughs> go to get eight foot of water and cast the Sanko. You'll catch a fish. Yep. Cast anything. I mean, just yeah. anything. Yeah. Um, so kind of getting back more on track where we were talking about, you know, Great Lakes fishing and whatnot. How does Lake Erie, you talked about, you know, pretty much once, I think you said October hits how that lull is all over from the summer. Yeah. Season to season, how – is it a drastic change on Erie? Is it a subtle change? Like, what adjustments are you making as the season goes on? It's literally a light switch. So what happens is all the fish that are out suspended – not even suspended. They're living on all the deep rock and isolated rock piles. They all can join and 
four or five areas and you find literally massive schools of fish. So hundred, there could be groups of a hundred fish in spots. So for an example of my buddy Destin and I going back to him last fall, I don't think I was on Erie for a month and he just comes up and we ran a tournament for just because the weather looked good. We had 17 boats. I think it was his second drop down with a blade bait. He hooked a five pounder and both swung it. And we ended up catching 65 fish, 60 or 70 fish, I think, that whole day. And this is the crazy part. It was muddy. The lake had no viz up to 40 foot of water. We were still putting the rails to it. Like, it was just the most insane day ever. <laughs> that is wild. I can't, I'm trying to picture a muddy Lake Erie. That's... The day before, we were going to have the tournament on Saturday, and it blew like a son of a gun on Saturday. I think there was small craft warning, five to eight footers. And it blew for like four days straight, so the whole shoreline was just ripped apart. They were catching our fish in 30 foot of water, and it's probably like a mile and a half offshore. And there was a mud line out to 40 foot, which is about three miles offshore. It was just crazy, like insane. It, it makes me wonder because you know how like the, there's a thermocline and whatnot, and that makes me almost kind of curious if, like, if there's a almost like a thermocline for. If there's a clear versus a muddy water where it cuts so, off at some point. I think what was happening was it actually was something similar to that. The lake was so rough that it was just a muddy surface and then below it was clear. Because there was little spots where you could see where it was clearing up and then be muddy again. So we're like, huh, that could be why. Because we were catching on normal baits, green pumpkin, straight silver blade baits, bright blue sunny skies, no wind. It was just insane. I think... 28 pounds won that day, and then we had 25-5 and took second. And we had a six-pounder as a kicker, and then the team who won had, I think, a 6-8 and a 6-4. That's nuts. I think there was, like, I think there was four fish, four or five fish weighed in over six, and everyone had two or three five-pounders in their bag. That's nuts. (laughs) It's just... It's got to be that there... It's got to be that... It was almost like a thermocline going on, essentially, where not like a temperature difference, but a clarity difference. Yep. Where it's almost like they, it's almost like us in clouds. Like it was almost kind of like that. So the funnier part was in the muddy water, we would get all of our big bites and we would slide out to clear water and it was like a nursery. Every two to four pound fish was in the clear water. And if you slide back in, you would catch a giant. So it's just like, all right, this makes no sense. <laughs> so <laughs> and it weird. definitely was a clarity thing. So, I think it was clear on the bottom where we were getting them, and then it was muddy on the surface. As if when we first showed up, it was still kind of dark out. There was no way if that water was muddy that he would have banged a smallie like that right off the bat, being as big as it was, if that water was muddy. Smallies run from muddy water. So, <sighs> yeah, that's it's it's got to be the deal going on if for at least for that day. That's yeah. that's interesting. I kind of. That's kind of new. I'm not used to that. That's kind of it makes you it makes you think, which is kind of well, cool. cool about sport. Out on Myers Reef, it was the same situation. It was in the spring. There was a big blowout on all the creeks, and when you'd hit your trolling motor, it would actually push the muddy water and make it clear. So, oh, like, okay. okay, so it's just surface water, like, but now yeah. below it's clear, and the top is it was super weird. I'm like. I've never experienced this before, and then I experienced it again in the fall. And I'm like, it's just got to be the way it filters. And I'm not a scientist, so I couldn't explain it. <laughs> That's it's what's cool about fishing is that there's a different scenario each day. Absolutely, okay. it always changes. Always changes, and it always makes you think because it's it's one of the guys I used to fish with. He described it as like it's like a math problem. How so how you know the formula is going to stay the same but the numbers are always changing where it's there's it's something different going on but you can always piece the puzzle together if you you know you know the right parts to it yep which is it's crazy that's what's awesome about this sport is nothing you know you're not going to get bored with it and if you are getting bored with it then you're doing something wrong Correct. <laughs> yeah Correct. so Which, like going back to my practice here this week wednesday we had I think three to five mile an hour southeast winds, bright blue skies, no wind. Thursday was the same thing. Friday blew a little bit more out of the west, and then went flat calm, all bright blue skies. 
Saturday morning tournament game. It blew 35 out of the west. It closed the lake, and all of my fish in the river were almost unfishable. So we were blessed to get the almost 18 pounds that we had fishing dangerous to marginal conditions on the Niagara River. So I've never seen two to four foot waves in the Niagara until that day on Saturday. That's crazy. That, but, and so, then that with the current, too. Yeah, so what happens is the Niagara River flows south to north, right in the Niagara Falls, and it goes down to the lower Niagara. When they're, But at points around Grand Island, it will flow, like, west or east, depending on what side of the river you're on. And with that strong west wind, it was just stacking against the current. So you had the current going one way and the wind pushing it. It was just creating these stacks of waves that were just crazy. I wish I would have gotten a video of it because it wasn't terrifying, but it was unsafe for sure. Yeah. But the current conditions. Boat control has to be huge. Um, so we were fishing a ledge that normally the current is two miles an hour. We were getting pushed backwards off the ledge and upstream. Imagine fishing, imagine trying to fish that. <laughs> I don't how, how heavy of a weight were you guys having to throw for that? Um, three quarter ounce drop shot weights, and I was using a half ounce football jig. So I feel like even a half ounce just sounds light there. Like it's well, the ledge goes from like I think it goes from like ten foot to twenty five, so the fish were sitting right on the lip. So if yeah. you can feel the ten, as soon as it would fall off, if you didn't get a bite, you just reel it up and cast it back up and keep going so yeah. 10 foot of water half ounce isn't too bad my partner josh was fishing the deep side of it so he was specifically targeting the fish deeper on the ledge okay tag team in that that makes sense oh when you're tournament fishing and team yeah team tournament you should always be throwing something different yeah i think the only time my buddy and buddies and i who i i used to fish tournaments with my buddy nate Weislaw. yep and uh we would, the only time we ever thrown something the same was like when we had a really good top water bite. Yep. And that's just when you're just you're fishing for schoolers, and that's it's that, that's about the only time you should be. So yeah. like you're, if you're both flipping, you're both trying to make something a little bit different. Yep. One guy's throwing a jig, the other guy's throwing a rodent or a beaver or yep. a brush hog. So yeah. And even if it's something different, where it's like because we've done this this thing where we've thrown the same plastic same color um like we'll throw the same rage bug but at the same time i'm throwing it texas rigged and he's throwing it on a swing head yeah um, one thing we found with canisius is actually pretty good throwing a swing head i mean not just canisius finger lakes in general um that's one thing that's gotten into my arsenal a lot more is a swing head because uh, you can use them in so many different ways you can slow roll them with, with swim baits you can drag them like a football jay you can flip them it's kind of wild yeah. i've had a good swing head bite on canisius in the pre-spawn when they yeah. get shallow there oh so much fun you just bang it off any rock you can find yeah large mouth chew that thing <laughs> that's the best part too it's completely weedless so yeah. I mean, you don't really worry about much um duh, i miss that lake i miss that lake in its prime when do you come home uh, i come home december 21st so <laughs> yeah <we're> frozen <laughs> yeah it won't be <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've been talking to my buddy Forrest, uh, a couple of my buddies. Uh, I don't know if you know Jordan Kofta or any of the guys uh, at Pursuit Productions. Um, we've been talking about going out ice fishing. I, I went out once, and everybody's catching fish and bluegill around me, and I wasn't catching anything, so I just decided to drink my coffee and watch. <laughs> I'm a bit of a ice fisherman, so I, I tend to stay away from hard water. Not yeah. my forte. I, I would rather risk my life steelhead fishing and stand on an ice ledge then stand out a nice lake i i don't understand it but something about staring at a four inch hole all day just doesn't excite me <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's something where i don't know it doesn't seem most fun to me but i don't think i gave it enough of uh an effort at least right. gotta give it another shot so i'm gonna i definitely if, if i'm back home in new york because i have no idea where this job's gonna take me afterward um i really want to tr get more ice fishing I want to go catch a steelhead. I've never caught a steelhead. And then also really want to go get after some coyotes if uh, the opportunity comes up. Uh, I lo I've only done it like once or twice. I've never shot one. But my, my brother and I are huge into trying to go after coyotes. We, we talk about it all the time. Just never go. So Well, you got to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We got to have to. We'll see. I mean, 
he's in college now, so it might be a little bit difficult, but winter break, maybe we'll catch some time to do it. But getting back into our fishing talk. Um, <laughs> Deviated a few times here. <laughs> yeah, we, we keep branching off here. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's kind of fun. But uh, so talking about tournament fishing, um, you just we just had one this past week. You had an open on the river because the, the lake got closed off. Um, we talked about that a little bit, but do you want to go go a little bit more into detail as you guys' plan on you know the whole gist of how it went? So our plan was spoiled. So Friday, me and Josh went out pre-fishing on Erie. We found three or four really good schools of fish. We thought we we didn't think we could win on them, but we thought we could get like a top ten. In practice, we didn't stick every fish we saw. We had, I think it was 22 pounds. I always weigh every fish light on my scale. And that was with a 3.5 or a 3.6. I think I posted on my Instagram page. And um, the one school we found was big ones. When you're scanning on side scan, you find rock and a little transition off the side. And you can see them on the side scan. I literally... We got off of idle. I dropped my drop shot right to him and hooked one instantly. And I think it was a four eight. So I was like, "That's a school of all big ones." And we had three areas like that. They were all big. So we're like, "We might be able to catch twenty three to twenty five pounds and take a shot." Yeah. And, and we looked at the wind forecast and we're like, "Oh, it got worse." So we had to go to Plan B. And I was like, "Thankfully, I pre-fished the river on Thursday," but. All of my spots are so windblown that it was almost nearly impossible to fish. So we literally just fished by the seat of our pants and took what we had and still took a good run at it. We came up one fish short from having a really good tournament. So need a four pounder, and I think our small fish was three and a quarter. If we would have caught that four pounder, we would have came in like ninth or tenth, I think. Okay. Fishing. Kind of, yeah. It just seemed like you just went junk fishing. Yep. So, I mean, the plan, fishing Lake Erie and Niagara are basically all the same baits. It's just getting your mindset and either dropping on them to fishing current all day and how it's going to be with the wind. Yeah, it's a lot of drift fishing from what I've, what I've heard. <laughs> I'm kind of essentially just fishing the St. Lawrence. Yep. So. It's, uh, I think I fished the St. Lawrence once. I don't I don't know what the current speeds are there, but on the river you're fishing anywhere from one and three quarter mile an hour up to four miles an hour, depending on where you're fishing. If that upper river books <laughs> it's four oh my gosh. There's spots that are like three and a half to four miles an hour. That's wild. I mean, coming from a kayak angler, you can't fish that. No, you would be uh if you tried to fish one spot, you would be You'd hook a fish and be about a mile downstream trying to land it. So, and have fun paddling back upstream. Oh my gosh. That just hurts thinking about it. <laughs> Jeez. I, I do want to get back out on Erie on the kayak. I have, a, I have upgraded, I have a pedal drive now, so I kind of want to get offshore. Yeah. I, just need to, I just need to get a graph with side imaging. The so best time to do it in Buffalo would be July, July and August to go offshore. <laughs> Okay. If you have a decent graph, you can find rock piles, and the fish tend to stack up. Not all of the fish, but some of the good fish will stack up in front of buffalo. Isolated rock piles, maybe a mile off the break walls, half mile out. Yeah. I do want to go up into Canada on that Erie side and try that, too. Cause I've... A lot of current over there. Is it? <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, okay. Maybe I won't go to the Canadian side with the kayak. <laughs> it's a bunch of different things you have to think about. Whereas Kenesha, yeah. you, all you look at is wind. And yep. if, is it windy? Are there storms coming? And that's all you have to worry about. Right. Yeah. So, so. Lake Erie, it's everything. It's is it going to be sunny? Is it going to be cloudy? Is it going to blow? Is it going to rain? Is it going to snow? Like it's like what is? What am I facing with today? And then the other thing is nine times out of ten the weather will say one thing, and you'll get there and it'll be doing something completely different in the Buffalo area. So it's it's always throwing you a curveball. I've seen the wind change four times in one day in a tournament. So it's just Gosh. like, like, and you ever have to adjust to the fish. So because they'll stack up on those boulder piles based on which way the wind is blowing, because the current will change, and it's it's fun. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. 
it's it's just a different animal compared to a lot of fisheries all over the country. It's it really is. Crazy. I do want to get up to Lake Michigan here and give that a shot too. You should, uh, um, especially coming up when now that it's getting colder. Yep. This week is actually a down week for me at work, so I, I do plan on making the trip up there, going on one of the piers. And what was that? Do you have your kayak with you? No, uh, they, my parents wouldn't budge. They kind of wanted me to be focused on the job, so they wouldn't let me throw the kayak on the on the car. I wasn't. I don't have a truck. I just have a car. Then. What's that? Yeah, find someone to go fishing with. So I have a, a couple of friends them. up in up in Michigan that we've talked about going out. Uh, we might try to make a day. Uh, I don't know if you know Extreme Outdoorsman, uh, Dylan Grubb. Uh, heard the name, I think. We, uh, we've we been talking about trying to meet at St. Clair for a day, which would be a dream fishery for me. Heck yeah. It, so it's funny. If I wanted to go to Oneida, right, it will take me three hours to get to Oneida. If I wanted to cut through Canada, I could get to St. Clair in about four from my house. Surprised you haven't done that yet. I haven't. <laughs> Because I'm, I have no reason to go there. Why would I drive four hours to go to St. Clair when I can fish? <laughs> like, <laughs> this, like, is true. this is true. I'll tell you what. If you drive to St. Clair, just go across the lake, pick me up, and we'll go fishing. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, I a boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a boat, yeah, that's true. So I, I think I'm going to buy a Lund Pro V bass. So I, that's what I'm looking at. Something I can fish big water with and the Finger Lakes still. Nice. Kind of very versatile in that aspect. That's good. Yeah. Plus, learn how to musky fish, so that would be yep. a good mas- musky platform on it. That would be that'd, good. That would be fun. You could yeah. do some trout fishing on the bar. Now, that's something we have to do once I learn how to do it. That would be fun. Yeah. Some slimy grease chickens. and that's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a blast. You just... I mean, I know you, you talked about you're going to be looking to get some guiding in the summer, but are you looking at doing any more tournaments, or is that going to be put on hold? Next summer or? This, this coming summer. This coming summer. Um, I don't know what trail I'm going to fish at. I'm, if I get the boat, which I plan to do, I'm either going to fish probably the Fed or ABA. I haven't decided yet. I got to really break down where they're fishing. Do I want to travel? How far do I want to travel? Might just stick to fishing some opens. There's a Lake Erie tournament trail on Wednesday nights that they fish. Um, Safe Harbor League. I mean, me and my buddy, we have a he bought a scale that we might just run some tournaments. It's all up in the air. Yeah, we'll see. The tournaments are always to be there. That's my pride and joy. I love, I love the adrenaline of it. I don't get quite jacked up for them until the morning of. I used to never be able to sleep, but. When you drive two hours, you need to learn how to sleep. So. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my struggle right now. Is I've I've done tournaments. I won a tournament on Cayuga two years ago, and I pulled an all nighter the night before because I simply couldn't sleep. I'm like, well, if I'm not gonna sleep, I might as well entertain myself. And I just watched YouTube until I, until I had to leave. Oh yeah, it was, just, it was the drive home was I had I had to stop twice to go take a little cat nap because it was like this is not safe. Uh, you you were shot. Yeah, it was not my proudest moment, but I mean, it's 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 a learning lesson. It's really all I look at it. So. How old are you now, Bailey? I am twenty-one. You will learn. That's about when I was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I was twenty-one, I was working two jobs. I would get out of work at like one a.m. and have to be up at three for a tournament. And I'm like, screw this. I'm not going to sleep. I'll just hitch a ride with my buddy and sleep the whole way home. Yeah. So <laughs> there, you, there you go. Like I remember the one tournament, I was so exhausted. I would literally every time we'd move, I would sleep from spot to spot, just on the bass boat. Like <laughs> probably isn't the safest thing to do, but I would just zonk out in the passenger seat. I'm like. I'm so shot. <laughs> that's that's a grind, man. You're a trooper. Oh yeah, it was, it was fun. That's get up, working. Yeah. Get fish, catch a fish, be all jacked up, sit down, fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, you're just you're just dead sick in a drop shot, snoozing in the passenger seat. Oh, I would make sure I'm throwing like a moving bait to stay awake, or chatter bait, or spinner bait. I mean, I'm I fish my drop shot probably different than everyone else, so. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. Like a lot of people think you have to dead stick the drop shot. I put as much movement on my bait on slack line as I possibly can. Yeah. In in a um 
ununiform cadence. Let's just say, you know, like if you're fishing a jerk bait, you know, you go one and then three, two, three, one. You're always switching it up. I'll shake my rod tip at different cadences to give that bait a little shimmy on the bottom. It's so something that they're not used to seeing. It's something a little different. Yeah. So not not flowing with the norm, kind of doing something that they're as good because that you're trying to give something that they haven't seen. Exactly. So if the guy in front of me, like I, one of my favorite things to do is fish behind someone because I'm like I will catch every fish or at least some of the fish that you miss. Like just because I I fish differently than most of anyone I know. So I'm. I just try, I'm always observing. Yeah. So the guy in front of me is going through an area with a chatterbait. I'm not going to go through with a chatterbait. I, if the grass is good, I might slow down and throw a jig behind them. You're going to catch fish or you're going to bump a shot, maybe a brush hog or um, maybe a five inch Senko or a six inch Senko. Like you're going to do something different. You're going to catch fish. It's yeah. fun watching tournament anglers sometimes. You'll see a guy catch a fish on a chatterbait. And if you look around, You'll see everybody else scramble and pick out the chatterbait, right? So I'm like, you never. I try to never follow what everyone else is doing. Yeah, I watch what they're doing to see what they're doing and what I could do different to see if I can get a bite. And usually it works out in your favor. Usually, there's yeah. been times where I've been caught zero, but <laughs> I'm just like, ah, try to fly by the seat of the pants. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because I've never. Obviously, like, you know, when you go to a tournament here, you can't help yourself but kind of peek at what other people are kind of using. Yeah. But it's it's hard to – it's not hard, but it's it's difficult to watch people see you catch what like fish on what you're using and watch them switch to it. It's almost frustrating because you put that work in to find that pattern, and then they go and, you know, reproduce it somewhere else. But it's – it's it's interesting. I've never had seen that perspective where you're like you're looking at their baits to see what not to use. Like almost some sense of like, okay, I can do better. But it's, yeah. it's just it's a confidence thing. I'm like, you know what? I seen him caught. He's caught one fish. This grass is good. He's fishing too fast, or she's fishing too fast. So let me slow down and really pick this apart because I know this is a good area based on the way it looks, the contour lines, and it usually works in my favor. So. Yeah. That being said, I don't like to follow people to spots anyway. So it's usually if we both pull into an area at the same time. Hey, is it okay if I fish here? I know I see you're pulling in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll try to do something completely different than that person. I I do not like fishing in groups. I I will go out of my way to find something where no one else is fishing. I oh my I can't relate to that even. Well, I can't relate to that hard. Like it's I love to be on my own. Yeah. Hate when I'm around people. Um, when I'm like, when I'm, you know, when I'm just fun fishing, obviously I love to go out with friends and stuff like that, meet with people, but also I love my, my alone time to be yeah. by myself. But like when it comes to tournament fishing, I hate being around people. Um, cause it just, it's not that it's a bad thing, but I think in a sense where it put, it subconsciously puts a different stress on me, yep. um, where they're watching my every move or maybe they're do, doing something. Then it's like, the game if you're jacking them and you're not, and you're like, what am I doing wrong? So now you're spinning yeah. it up. And the biggest thing I can ever tell any tournament angler is don't focus on anyone else. Just focus on yourself. Even though I just said I watch everyone, what everyone's doing, but it's just like, <laughs> it's a comfort thing for me. Like I am like, my friends will tell you when they, my friends that fish with me, I am like, I am a madman in control. I'm like a bomb that went off, but I've, I'm perfectly in sync. Like I know exactly where everything is, what I'm doing. But yet I'm like like a dog. I can I can hear that minnow splash 35 feet away from me. You're like, did you hear that? <laughs> and they're like, no. Like throw my bait over there and catch one. They're just like, what the heck? <laughs> like just zone. When I'm when I'm in the zone, I'm in the zone. It's so, instinct. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And the the best piece of advice I've gotten, and that was it was a night before. Um, I had fished a Cayuga event. There was 50 plus anglers, probably the biggest tournament I had been in that to that date. Um, I had just gotten done with finals my my junior year, and my father had allowed me to take the truck, take the kayak, and go pre-fish three days before the tournament. Um, so I stayed at a campground on Cayuga. Um, the first day I didn't really get to fish much. I had to fish the, the canal up in there because it was blowing 20 miles out of the south. Um, so yeah, that was that was rough. Um, and it was 15 miles the next day, but um, 
I had pre-fished. I found a good spot mid lake out of Union, and then I found another good spot just north where there's a whole video on how I won the tournament um, way back in the my YouTube. But I had I was pre-fishing, and I ran into my buddy Scott, and the the stretch of corn like the of corn tails or cattails. Yeah. Um, cattails. We we found yeah. Okay. <laughs> whatever you want to call him yeah. um, he was he was flipping them and he was catching a bunch of, of males and um he's like oh there's just a bunch of dinks back in here like i think uh you know the bigs aren't here and i i thought about it for a second after he left um and it was just like if the males are in there it's not even spawn yet that means that the females have to be hanging outside of it yep and this time of year i don't want to just i don't want flipping as much as i love it i don't want to flip Yep. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, water's a little dingy. Let's throw a black and blue chatterbait. First cast, I hook into a 19 and a half, four pounder. I'm like, okay, yep. Let's just, it might it might be a fluke. So I one more cast down the edge of the cattails, three pounder. I'm like, all right, I, I figured it out. It's, yep. and then he, I, he, uh, he had found the, the spot originally. And he goes, I'm not going to go there. And I'm like, I was honest with him. Like, I, I gotten some good fish. If you, you found it. You can you can take it, and he goes he goes ah I think I'm gonna go to the rock pile on that railroad, and you go I'm like okay, and then that's one of the parts that was was bugging me is because I knew how good that railroad is, uh, how good it could be, but I kind of focused and hunkered down at it was really that night before I was texting my buddy Dave Fenlin, and he, I was like I don't know what to do because I know the fish are there, but I know there's gonna be a lot of people there, and he goes be the best you that you can be, and it was so simple, but it made so much sense in that time where I'm like. All I wanted to do was fish the cattails, but I knew that Rail had fish. I'm like, but if I want to do this, let's go do this. Yeah. I, I ended up winning the tournament in the first half an hour. I caught three 19 inches, and I was like, I didn't ha- tag, I didn't know it obviously because there was a whole tournament ahead of me. But I could have, yeah. I could have called it quits in that after 7:30 and just would have won. Um, that was the craziest day of fishing I've ever had. Tossing back 18s like it was, those were like four pounders, like it was nothing because it's pre spawn. Yeah. So, it was a crazy day, but it's like, it's it's such a mental game, tournament fishing. It really is, and not many people realize that. It's so much into it. It's crazy. It can be very stressful. One of my favorite things to do, like every tournament day, I wake up usually an hour before, hour and a half before I have to leave. I'll take a shower. I'll get out. I'll eat breakfast, and then as soon as I get in my car, I turn on the most grungy beat down hard rock i can get listened to and i just jam the whole way because the biggest thing i want to do is be loose i want to be loose when i'm fishing because if i'm uptight i'm freaking out i'm tweaking it just never goes well so i was all amped i think it was not this summer i just passed but the summer before i just had my last boat and we had a tournament at canisius i love canisius and I got all out of whack the night before, and I ended up going there. I won the tournament, but I remember my first four fish, I lost them all at the boat because I was just way too hyped up. I wasn't loose. I was tweaked, and two of those were four-and-a-half pounders, and I, I still won by two or three pounds. I, it was a little club derby. I think there was like 10 of us. I had 17 pounds, I think, but I could have had 20 or 21, but I ended up losing – a really good one on a buzz bait, another one on a Sanko, and another one on a jig. And it was like two four and a half and a three and three, three and a half to four pounder that all came off in the first 15 minutes of the day. I'm just like, oh, what the heck? So I literally, right after that moment, I pulled out. I was like, I will, I know they're here, but right now, if I try to hook another one, I'm going to lose it. So I pulled out. I went for a five minute boat ride up the lake to a spot I have, just a simple weed edge. And I drop shot and got my limit of like, 13 pounds and i went back and milked my big fish the rest of the day and i ended up landing every one i hooked so yeah. it's just one of those things is like i need to settle down and go catch a one pounder get into the boat and relax <laughs> yeah. it's it's all mindset and it's like you you'll have people that say like if you know fishing is supposed to be fun and it is it's it's an amazing sport fun but fishing is fun. <laughs> yeah yeah and they'll, they'll ask you they're like well why do you tournament fish it's so stressful but it's just like some of us have that competitive edge, like it's almost like a we need uh, the fix that we need to we need to scratch. Like it's, it's, it's different in the sense of I like to enjoy my tournament fishing, but at the same time I want to be competitive. Uh, I don't like failure, um, so like at the same time your mind's going through like what scenario, what area is going to be the best. 
And that's like what you, that's what stresses you out is making the right decision. Cause that's all tournament fishing is decision making. I mean, that's, it's entirely what it is. The right yeah. decision at the right time to pull up to the right area. Yep. So it's, it's, it, the biggest thing is it's all timing. Everything is timing. Yep. So you could be on the juice and have the biggest fish found in the lake, but you could pull up there at 7 a.m. knowing that it's an afternoon bite and never going to get, and never can get bit and you waste three hours trying to get it done and then you never come back to it because you're like oh they must have left but you caught them at six o'clock the night before so you know it's a night deal it's like so one of my biggest things i have with bay fishing is if i'm going to catch fish i want to catch them during tournament hours. i want to catch them between seven and three or eight and four or six and two anything after that it's just trying to find good weeds yeah if they bite there at night, they're not going to bite there in the day. So I try not to pre-fish at night at all. Yeah. I, I, oh, that's, that's smart. It, it's burned me a few times on Lake Erie. Like, find stuff late in the afternoon, and I show up there in the morning, and they're gone. And I'll show up at, like, 2.30, a half hour before I run in, and they're there again. So yeah. there, there are periods where they'll be in different areas based on light, where the sun position is, wind. So it's... One of my that's one of my biggest tips I taught my friend Justin. If you're gonna pre-fish, pre-fish when the tournament hours are because that will give you the biggest indication of where the fish live. Anything yeah. after two o'clock or three o'clock is all bonus finding. Just scan and graph and go check it the next day. Yeah, if you catch fish there at night. They're not gonna be there during the tournament. Eight out of ten times. Yeah. My- yeah, yeah, that's what you. If you watch like a lot of the the live feeds for different tournament trails, they'll mention you'll see you hear the mention where it's like I have my afternoon spot waiting, yep. you know, and to be like I don't have any fish right now, but wait until you know eleven a.m. eleven thirty, then I'll have fish. Yep. Yeah, because you have to have a morning spot and an afternoon spot. You have to because you know not you're, you're very rarely you'll find a want a spot that'll be good all day long. Exactly. Consistently, it's. So that's very important to bring up too. That was good. Um, so kind of wrapping up a little bit. Is there any pro staff or social media you want to highlight in here? I mean, base, biggest one I use is my Instagram, um, Andrew Full underscore Fishing, I believe it is. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I've been with a plastic worm company from the state of Washington. It originally was from Oregon. Rusty Bell was the old owner. WFO, they do steelhead and bass baits. Um, I've helped like create a couple little fun colors. One is uh, green pumpkin sculp, and that's a green pumpkin candy color with a gray belly to it. That's incredible at certain times of the year. And then they have great steelhead worms. P line is a big one that I'm with. I'm on their um, promotional team, and then obviously blue tungsten. and everybody loves tungsten baits. Those are huge as well. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um and just kind of lastly wrapping up um yeah if you guys want to see any big small mouth go check them out on instagram um <laughs> always you, at help so ask any questions like there's secrets that i won't tell you but i will point you <laughs> <laughs> no man, man can't get up his jewels you know right so um again wrapping up like if, if you had to obviously Erie's your baby but favorite lake favorite bait Favorite lake, favorite bait. Ooh, it's tough because it's all situational based for me. Every lake I go to, I find something different. But I would have to say my favorite lake and favorite bait is Honey Eye. Wait, with it, it's bait. Oh, what? Buzz bait. Oh, okay. It's because you can get invites. No, I I catch big fish at Honey Eye and Buzz baits. Oh, okay. So I've never really thrown a Buzz bait. I I. I just I, I don't know why it just annoys me because every time I throw it it just happens to be grassy yep. and I just, you know, I just get mad. <laughs> it's just like uh, my friend Justin witnessed it at Honey Eye. I think it it was last summer. It was a week before the season opener. We just went down there fun fishing. The largemouth were in a funk and the smallies were just coming off the spawn and they were fry guarding. And I was whipping that buzz bait around. I think I had sixteen pounds of smallies on Honey Eye and a buzz bait. And then every tournament there, the rest of the summer, I think I weighed in one open, I weighed in 11, another open, I weighed in 14 and a half. And then our club classic, I think I weighed in 13. Every fish was on a bus bait. 
<laughs> what? Yeah. All day long, I throw buzz bait. That's crazy. I love Hania. It's one of my absolute favorite lakes. It, okay. I, I don't, I, I think I do pretty well there compared. I didn't get to fish it this summer except for one time in May. I fished it in a snowstorm with a random trap, and that was an absolute blast. But <laughs> I think I caught like 45 fish that day in four hours, five hours, all okay. on one knocker, strike king red eye shad, and just insane. I mean, you're definitely going to catch numbers when you go there. But I'll be honest, I think you might be one of the only people that is ever going to say Honeyoy for her favorite I, lake. I love Honey. I like, I don't know why. It's just one of those lakes for me that if I could go anywhere just to catch fish, it would be Honey Eye. Oh, yeah. And I yeah. can catch fish once there. So I, I, my biggest largemouth ever came from Honey Eye. It was 6'7. It was on a drop shot, but. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Yeah, I've never known these things, but Honeyo, I didn't know they had fish like that. <laughs> I had to find the trophy and send a picture to you from the long pier. I think it was it was either six three seven or six seven three. It was <laughs> absolute giant. And the worst part is, the I remember it vividly. The next cast, I lost a four four and a half pound smallie at the boat. <laughs> was it during a tournament? Yeah. Oh my gosh! So and I ended up losing. Oh, I got only second place. Back. I had 12 pounds. I came in second place with a six, a six and a half pound kicker. <laughs> oh my gosh! The guy who won had 15 pounds. He caught all three pounders. I've just like always avoided that lake because I've only ever caught like a maximum. I think my biggest fish out there was like a three eight. I have, I have three spots that I rotate and five docks that have big fish. And that's five ducks. Five ducks. <laughs> five ducks. They were all waypointed, and I know where each one of them is. And that they're completely different than the rest of the lake of all the ducks. And every time I pull up on one of them in a tournament, I get a big bite. Ah. So. Sounds I, like I need to fish every single dock there this summer just to figure it out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, <laughs> the one dock, it's literally there's nothing around it. It's just one dock and. I want to tell you why the dock is so good because then you'll figure out why the rest of the docks are so good. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> it makes sense. So I, I just think it's funny. I don't think anyone else is ever going to say honey oil when I have on the podcast. Like, and then if I had to choose another favorite lake, it would probably, probably be the Lower Niagara. Okay. So, okay. Just... It's different. It dumps into Lake Ontario, and you can catch just giant smallmouth. So, in some days, it could be better than Erie. That's up towards um, Toronto, like, right? On Lewiston. Okay. Uh, yeah, that area. Okay. I've never been up there. I, it's there's a bunch of different places I need to venture out to and try. Right. Sure. Yeah. All right. But, so. So next I, one, friends will tell you they're not surprised I said honey. I, I love that lake. Dave always makes fun of me. He's like, "Why are you going to that crap hole?" I'm like, "I love that lake." <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> he always he always craps on a ton of the different lakes. He always craps on Canisius, but goes there all the time. I know he's like, "That lake sucks." I caught one fish on a jerkbait. I was like, "Why'd you throw a jerkbait in August?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's his. That's his staple. He loves that jerk bait. It's inner KVD. It's not a bad thing, but nobody can fish a jerk bait like KVD. So, yeah. all right. Uh, next question is one of my favorite ones. Um, and I say it's every episode, and I'm gonna keep saying it every episode. I love uh, tradition, so carry on. You what? Love tradition, so carry on. Okay. All right. If you were to have dinner with three different people, and it could be anybody at all in this in the entire globe, three different people for dinner, who would you pick? Bill Gates. Okay. Um, because he's picking up the tab, or what? No, I want to pick his brain to figure out why he got to be able to pay the tab. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Fair enough. Bill Gates. Um, in the fishing industry, I think it would be fun to sit down with Zona. Okay. And, and the third person, who would I want to talk to? I'd like to go back in time and talk to Albert Einstein. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just because I heard he was an extremely interesting feller, and I I like picking the brains of weird, interesting people. So that's the power three. Yeah, I'm a I'm a banker, so I I get to talk to different people on a daily basis. So I I really like figuring out why and how and. Yeah, just why and how people chose the way they live and how they're going to better themselves or why they bettered themselves. So there's always a story on why. Like a lot of these guys that are rich came up from nothing. So it's like, how did that happen? And then some people are handed it. So True. I think that would be an interesting three because if you pair up Einstein and Bill Gates' mind, holy crap, watch out. And then Zona can just commentate on it all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Come in with some interesting song lyric, and you're just like, "What's going on?" <laughs> like, that would I, be... I interesting people. I, I mean, everybody has their own story, so why not find out the best of the best story and why and how? Yeah, so. well, that's a lot of why I do this. Is just finding out people's story. It's it's fun. It's I, I love it. Um, house. Yeah. Have you ever watched or listened to the Joe Rogan podcast? No. If, if you're into learning different random things and learning about different people, you need to give that a shot. Will do. I it's, actually don't really listen to too many podcasts just because I'm always go, 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 go. I don't really have much time to sit down and reflect on the day as it is. And most of it lately, I mean, the last three to four months have really been that way just because of the new child. I'm still yeah. trying to figure out uh, routines and everything. But I'm home until... I think the third week of December now, so I get my friends to leave. So now I really get to settle down, start figuring out new routines. So it'll be nice. Yeah, I mean, it's I don't get to listen to it too much either. But when I've you know when I'm doing work or if I'm, like I'm at the work and it's downtime, I have headphones in and listen to a podcast, long drives, something like that, or just kind of chilling at home doing work. Yeah. Um, podcasts are just it's especially Joe Rogan's because he has on so many different unique people. Right. Um, I think the my favorite one so far is when he had Elon Musk on, and oh, another one I didn't even think of it. He would be an interesting one to pick yeah. up too. Like, like, I could tell you I didn't understand a single word he said, but it was probably the most interesting thing I've ever listened to. But it's <laughs> you learn some great, and there's some awesome ones like Kevin Hart was on there. Yep. And while he's a very famous person, it was probably it, it got me. It was so inspirational. It got me off my butt and headed to the gym and cleaned my entire house. Like I was. Yeah, it was just it's it's an awesome thing, especially if you if you're into learning different stories, you should give that a look. There was a video that went around social media, I think it was a year or two ago, it was of like a navy captain and he basically he goes, How do you be successful? You wake up in the morning and you make your bed after you roll yep. out. So yep. if you start your day off right, the rest of your day will be positive and right. It's the little things, it's yeah. It, there's all kinds of little stuff you can do in your life to make your day positive, to give you a positive outlook, to, I and mean, it, it, it goes to everything. So <laughs> yeah, I've seen that on, I've seen that on Facebook. That was, that's a good one. It's like a five minute video speech. And yeah. Ted talks used to be really good. Me, me and my wife used to listen to Ted talks on long kind of rides. So, yeah. So another good TED talk was uh, I forgot who it was. I think it was a Kurdish woman. She like ran for like local congressman or congresswoman or whatever her local district. And she set out to sit down with everybody of opposing views with her, and that she called the tea talks. And they would have tea and talk about their opposing views, just to find because no matter how many opposing views you have with anybody, you can find common ground and create a connection. So I think that's a huge misconception in today's society as well, is no matter how different you are from somebody, there's always something you can talk about that you have a commonality in. So, Yeah, it's that is, wow. Okay, yeah. Um, trying to think of what, um, uh, what was the episode I was just watching? Um, in essence, we need, we need that more today. Oh, it was... It was Joe Rogan. He just had it with Dakota Meyer. Uh, I don't know if you know who Dakota Meyer is. Heard the name. Yeah, he was he was uh won the Medal of Val- Valor. He was a Navy SEAL. Yep. Oh, um, I know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And he 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 mentioned in his podcast how 
He goes, I will never, ever, ever wish for another 9-11. But he goes, I would give anything for another 9-12. Yeah. Because he said the unity of our country was unbelievable. Absolutely. So, and that, that hit hard. I was like, okay, all right. That, I mean, because when you think of it for a second, it's back then he's like, everyone's helping everyone. Like he goes, he was, even the small things, everyone is holding a door saying, please, thank you. Everyone was letting someone hop in front of them in the next lane. Like it was just the smallest thing. Like everyone cared. Yeah. And he goes, and he goes this country is like right now is everyone will find the smallest thing just to hate you for. We nitpick. We are a nitpicking society. Yeah. <laughs> It's sad. Yeah. It's, well, getting away from the negatives, to yeah. to end all this, to end this podcast, I want to hear your favorite fishing memory. Oof. There's so many of them. First that comes to I, mind. The Probably my first ever club tournament win. This is a good one. I'm fishing with Probably one of my favorite mentors of all time. His name is Jimmy Thompson. He used to be dubbed Mr. Lake Erie. And we run to our first spot. He, he's an older gentleman. I think he's like 78, 79 now. He's, he had a 21 Super Hawk, the 225 Merc EFI on it. We run to our first spot. He looks at me and he goes, Andy, I did something. I did something very bad this morning. I go, what's that, Jimmy? He goes, I forgot the net. And... Uh -huh. All day long, because he's like 78, seven, I think at the time he's like 75, he has bad knees, bad shoulders and everything. So tying all of his lines for him, I ended up catching like 19 pounds on the river that day with a six, I think I had a six pound kicker and I had to belly all of my fish and his fish and I ended up winning the tournament. And I just, I think that's so surreal because we're fighting like those two and three mile an hour currents yeah. while I'm doing everything for this guy. Well. Belling every fish, calling fish for him, all because he forgot the net in the truck, like in the back of the truck. <laughs> oh my God. That's like, just... I don't know why that one sticks out. And then another funny one that you can ask Destin to Marion about this. And I wish he had it on GoPro. We we're fishing that tournament last year in the fall. And once again, we're catching giants on like blade baits and stuff. And, you know, I had this silly Mustang with the pole cord. And I bent over to belly a fish, and I ripped the pole cord as I'm bellying the fish. So he thinks the line snaps. So he goes, what just happened? I stand up, and I have the fish, and I am just popping out of the seams. <laughs> and we just laugh hysterically the rest of the day. Like, we still have conversation about it. Like, remember the time you freaking ripped the cord trying to belly a fish? I'm like, dude, it's so funny. So I ran around all day long with this stupid life jack popped out. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> like that shoulder pads, but what it is? I think it was the six-two we caught that I bellied when I ripped the drift cord. He's like, "What just happened?" I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! That was another good one. There, there's so many silly ones. I probably gave you a heart attack. Oh, I, I knew exactly what it was. Like instantly, I was like, "Son of a!" <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh. Yeah, I think I actually posted a picture of it on my Instagram, like, of the life jacket and my face all squished, and I was like, this is what happens today. <laughs> I'll have to, I'm going to have to go look for that. If I can find it. I might have it in my phone, so I'll send it to you just so you can have a good laugh. <laughs> uh, I definitely have to do that. There was like five or six boats around us, and we're like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, but all right. Well, yeah. Andrew, I really appreciate you coming on tonight. It's, uh, it's been a blast. Yeah, for sure. So whatever, whenever you have a free slot, I'll talk some more. So I don't mind it. Awesome. Sounds good. I mean, do you have any questions before we hop off? I am good, man. I I, th I thank you for the time. So, and uh, the other thing is whoever wants to go smallmouth fishing next year, look me up when I have my guide service open. So oh, you'll, you'll bet we'll be posting all over social media when that's official. So yeah, well. We'll get you on some big ones. I, I know some fun stuff. So awesome. spring and fall is going to be the jam. So. Sweet. You know, you know I'll give you the best business if it's there. So I appreciate it, man. I really do. So. Of course. Well, again, congrats on uh, the kid and growing the family. Thank uh, you. So Hope that stays smooth. Absolutely. And, uh, it's fun, interesting. I just I like your Mighty Ducks jersey there in the corner. Yeah, I got – let's see if I can twist this. It's, it's funny because I'm like – big hockey guy i'm a penguins fan but i'm also i got my paul korea mighty ducks jersey in the back let's talk about hockey right now how about the sabers 6-0-1 oh, 
they're they're looking good, but I don't want to say anything because this happened last year. This well, happened last but, year and then it fell off. Last year was a fluke. Seven of those ten games were overtime winners, and they came from behind. They're actually playing nine. Was it sixty minutes? Finally, as a hockey team. So we'll see. Bills are four and one. Sabers are six zero oh, and one. It's good in Buffalo sports. Right now. So we knock on wood. Big game against Miami this weekend. Yep. Yep. <laughs> It wouldn't be a it wouldn't be a surprise if Buffalo fluked on that one, but Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Buffalo's not my team, but uh, I, I root for them at heart just because we're from the area. Absolutely. So, so. all right. And, well, you have a good night and uh, get some sleep. I'm sure you have a hard work week ahead of you. Oh yeah. Well, I hope you uh, end up getting some sleep. Hopefully, not a lot of crying. <laughs> she sleeps like. 10, 11 hours at night now. So I, she's down now. I haven't heard her in about a half hour. So, Oh, well, that must be nice then. <laughs> I didn't do the same thing for my parents. I probably slept maybe three hours a night. Gosh, yeah. She goes, she goes down about 9, usually 8.39, and then she'll sleep till 6. And then she'll eat and then go back to sleep about 7.30 to 9, 9.30. So we got a routine down. That's that's good then. That's good. Yeah. That's good to hear. All right, man. Well, All right. Again. Easy. Thank you again for hopping on. Of course. I'll talk to you soon. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Andrew. Good one. Bye now.